Now I'm going to turn over the introductions of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the webinar coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Kelly, thank you and welcome everyone. Tonight we are delighted to bring you a unique webinar with two presenters, Dr. Harvey Bennett and Dr. Joshua Braun. They will be addressing the neurological and psychiatric approaches to treating TS. I'll introduce Dr. Bennett first and follow his presentation with Q&A. Dr. Braun's introduction will follow at the end of Dr. Bennett's Q&A. Dr. Bennett graduated from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and subsequently trained in pediatrics and neurology at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia and at the hospitals of Albert Einstein in New York. He is triple board certified in pediatrics, child neurology, and neurodevelopmental disabilities. Dr. Bennett was the founding director of the Division of Child Neurology and Developmental Medicine at the Goriab Children's Hospital at Morristown Medical Center in 2005. In 2014, he stepped down from administrative responsibilities to pursue his clinical and research interests in neurodevelopmental disabilities. Dr. Bennett is a clinical professor of pediatrics and neurology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Dr. Bennett, welcome. And now, without further introduction, I'll turn tonight's presentation over to you. Thank you. Um, it really is a, a pleasure to offer this uh, webinar tonight. It goes back a uh, number of months uh, in the making. Uh, I had uh, done a webinar for the New Jersey Rett Syndrome uh, Association uh, a number of years ago. I think that was on psychopharmacology. It was somewhat well received and um, Marty uh, recently called me and said, um, we'd like to have you again and can you think of a topic? We were thinking of uh, the neurobiology of Tourette's syndrome and um, uh, other neurological manifestations. Um, I thought this was an interesting topic but was concerned about um, it being um, too, uh, too dry and I started to think more and more about uh, Tourette syndrome, all my patients with Tourette syndrome, and said, well, what, what are really their problems? And the more I thought about it, um, I said, you know, they really have um, many psychiatric problems that are, um, I'm having trouble moving my slide. Can I go to my next slide? Um, you need to put it in slideshow mode. Oh, maybe I didn't do that. Right. Here I am in the next click, slide. Click on from current slide. Okay. So I really started thinking about um, Tourette syndrome and all of my patients and I and and since many of them have uh, psychiatric problems, which sometimes I as a neurologist can't help them with that much. Um, I started to think, is this a psychiatric disorder with neurological manifestations, or is this a neurological disorder with psychiatric manifestations? Around the same time that I was thinking about this and what to present, and thinking of the neurobiology of the psychiatric comorbidities, lo and behold, this article comes out, uh, a major study, uh, actually sponsored by the uh, international, uh, by the National Tourette Syndrome Association of um, the very large incidence of uh, psychiatric comorbidities in, in, in Tourette Syndrome. Also around this time, I attended a, a major movement disorder uh, conference at Mount Sinai um, School of Medicine, the Icon School of Medicine, where I'm faculty uh, at, in New York. and. Um, the whole day was devoted to different movement disorders. There was one lecture on, um, on Tourette syndrome, and that one lecture was, guess what, being given by a psychiatrist, Dr. Barbara Coffey, who's a very well-known psychiatrist who studied 
uh, studied and done, done research on Tourette syndrome for uh, many years and is an old friend. Um, and she and I spoke uh, a lot about what my webinar would, uh, would be and how to discuss this whole uh, is it a neurologic disorder or a psychiatric disorder uh, question. I'd like to, some of Dr. Coffey's slides are, um, um, are present tonight in my presentation. Um, I'd like to attribute those to her. The, um, so getting back to the question, is this a neurological problem or is this a psychiatric problem? Well, it's listed in the DSM, for those of you who know what it is, the DSM is the Bible, so to speak, of psychiatry where all psychiatric disorders and diseases are listed and uh, neurodevelopmental disorders are um, one of the topics in the DSM and as most of you know there is a, a new DSM, uh, the DSM-4 existed for many years and in 2013 the DSM-5 uh, came into being and um, it uh, certainly uh, has uh, three tick disorders um, that are described, what, what they describe as a provisional tick disorder, what they describe as chronic motor or vocal tics, and what they describe as Tourette syndrome. Um, sometimes I think um, that we're too much of splitters uh, rather than lumpers and that we should just all the same way the, the autism people now call everything autistic spectrum disorder, we should, we should all call this tick disorders of childhood. But it is important to have um, these differentiations. Um, so this is a neurologic disorder, which is um, <clears throat> the, the tick disorder is the, the neurological part, but it is certainly um, in the uh, uh, psychiatric uh, Bible, it is in the psychiatric literature, and there is these large comorbidities. So um, why do people get Tourette syndrome? What is the neurobiology? What is the pathophysiology? Why do people get um, Tourette syndrome? And um, why do they get tics? And why do they get the um, associated uh, uh, comorbidities, uh, psychiatric comorbidities of, of Tourette syndrome? First of all, this is a genetic disease. Uh, you have to have the gene to have it. We know this about many diseases. Now with genomics, we know who was, has a certain percent chan chance to get this kind of cancer or a certain percent, percent chance of getting this disorder. And um, that certainly is true um, for the genetics and genomics of, of Tourette syndrome. We know that uh, for years, we, and any clinician knows that uh, when you take your medical history, when that patient first walks into your office, one of your first questions is, well, who else in your family has tics? And um, here's a, a, on this slide are some uh, uh, very quick and good numbers about 80% concordance in twins and a 25% concordance for dizygotic twins. 40% um, of clinically referred families uh, have either, either tics or OCDs in, in, in first-degree first relatives. Um, this is definitely a genetic problem. I see this all the time when I ask families about uh, who else uh, has uh, tics in the, in the family. But we're also making great headways with, the, um, with, with, with genomics, with understanding the genes that are behind certain um, uh, traits and certain uh, uh, biological and neurobiological conditions. Uh, and if you can understand what the genomics, what, what the gene problem is of, of a certain enzyme deficiency, for example, such as in this uh, uh, fascinating paper in New England Journal in 2010, which describes uh, a certain enzyme deficiency called histidine decarboxylate, it's easier to say HDC deficiency. And that particular uh, enzyme deficiency um, is involved in the biosynthesis of histamine, and histamine is involved in, um, in, uh, in the release, inhibits, it inhibits the release of dopamine, and dopamine, as we all know, is the major culprit in um, 
too much dopamine that is, is the major culprit in, in patients with tick disorders and, and patients with hyperkinetic tick, tick disorder, uh, movement disorders of which Tourette's syndrome is the most uh, infamous. Um, uh, as we speak, there are probably pe people doing research on, uh, on the different receptors um, uh, that are involved in histamine and, and, and dopamine um, uh, agonists and um, new drugs uh, very well might be targeted one day to, to affect uh, ticks at their very root. Uh, it's not, not so simple. Uh, uh, Tourette syndrome uh, is uh, understanding the neurobiology of it as I just went through at that um, that fascinating, um, let me go back to that slide for a second. By the way, that, that 2010 paper, um, the reason it was so fascinating that they, um, where they found that uh, gene missing, uh, it was missing in one particular family. There was one family where eight children out of eight children had Tourette syndrome. Those same eight out of eight children and the father uh, had um, HDC deficiency, and they all had clinical Tourette syndrome, and um, uh, it's it's obviously uh, related. Too much of a chance not to be related. So therefore, Tourette syndrome is not one lesion in the brain. We can't do an MRI scan, and we can't do a uh, uh, EEG. We can't do a CAT scan and say, ah, the lesion's there, and this is Tourette syndrome. There is uh, a uh, neuroanatomy related to Tourette syndrome. This is a graphic of the neuroanatomy. Most important parts of the nervous system involved in Tourette syndrome are those um, uh, blue arrows, are the chordate, the putamen, the globus pallidus. Those are all called the striatum. Um, and the whole feedback loop, and you see some of those arrows there. Um, let me get it. This feedback loop between the frontal cortex and the and the striatum um, that's on both sides, but uh, uh, the, the, there is an important uh, feedback loop between the frontal uh, cortex, the thinking part of the brain, so to speak, and the uh, striatum. That's why tick disorders almost never occur in sleep, um, and movement disorders in general almost never occur in sleep. Uh, and that's why when we're excited, uh, where our ticks might be worse uh, in certain situations, our, our ticks might be worse, uh, and uh, it, our um, mental state has a good deal to do with, uh, uh, with, with our ticks. So uh, a quick review is that the role, the role of basal ganglia, which is the other word for that, is striatum in Tourette syndrome. Um, uh, normally, our basal ganglia lets us do a certain motor pattern, it lets it do it smoothly. And there's a, a balance between the neurochemicals involved. But in TS, there's increased areas of excitability with uh, uh, less inhibition, and um, there's uh, an exaggerated response. And that's why Tourette syndrome um, is the ultimate hyper movement disorder. It's almost all movement disorders can be described uh, hypokinetic uh, or hyperkinetic. The, um, uh, the best example of hypokinetic movement disorder, um, less movements is uh, Parkinson's where there's a dopamine deficiency. But in um, uh, Tourette syndrome, there's too much dopamine around and that's a, um, a hyperkinetic movement disorder. Um, there, there are, as I said earlier, there was no you can't make a diagnosis of uh, um, Tourette syndrome from an MRI scan, but there are sophisticated imaging techniques where people on a research level have found uh, a reduction in caudate volume, for example, um, perhaps some cortical thinning, but certainly not a diagnosis to be made on the basis of imaging. Um, so what happens in Tourette syndrome? You need a genetic predisposition. You need um, an impaired balance between the, the cells and their neurochemicals. It's dopamine hyperinnervation or increased dopamine transmission. And there's this impaired corticostriatal thalamic loop, this impaired feedback mechanism between the, the uh, frontal cortex and the striatum. And ergo, the symptoms that um, 
that the ticks, the ADHD, the obsessive compulsive disorders. I wanted to mention this uh, pandas issue because people always ask about it. I uh, really do not want to talk about it a long time. It's uh, been around for a long time. The um, the first paper was in uh, in 1998. Um, uh, it's rather controversial. Um, uh, PANDAS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Strep. And there definitely are some children uh, who have uh, increased ticks when they have strep infections, but some of those increased ticks could be with any infection. And there's no definitive proof uh, at this point that uh, it's the strep per se. Um, certainly, um, uh, sometimes there are uh, uh, antibody tests that uh, prove that there was a strep infection. Um, the problem with that is that strep infections are so ubiquitous, we're just, uh, we just don't understand um, um, this particular subgroup uh, very well. But it, it, it probably does exist, probably in, in a small group of patients. Ticks. Ticks are the hallmark of Tourette's syndrome, right? We saw that in our definition. Um, ticks are sudden, rapid, repetitive, non-rhythmic movements or vocalizations which occur in the contacts of, um, of an otherwise normal uh, uh, young man or young woman. Um, in, they can be increased by stress, excitement, fatigue. I have some parents who tell me that uh, when my child is stressed, the ticks are worse. I have other parents who tell me that uh, when my child's watching TV, vegging out, I watch him, he ticks like crazy, and he, he doesn't know I'm watching him. So um, at ticks, I always tell parents, that I, I think ticks often have a mind of their own. Um, but sometimes ticks are um, accompanied by a premonitory urge, and that's very important, particularly when it comes to uh, certain treatments, uh, such as habit reversal therapy and cognitive behavioral therapies. Um, if you can feel something happening or about to happen, then you, prop, you can perhaps modulate that uh, psychodynamically um, by doing something else in its stead. Um, there is this older classification of uh, motor tics and, and vocal tics. We still use it. Um, it's still helpful, and as you saw, it's even in DSM-5, uh, either chronic motor tics or chronic vocal tics. But, uh, in a sense, they're all the same. Ticks are ticks, they're and they're usually easily discernible what, what they are. But there is what physicians call a differential diagnosis. Not everything that looks like a tick is necessarily a tick. There are lots of different movement disorders, and on this slide, borrowed from Dr. Coffey, um, it, there is um, a list of different movement disorders, uh, dystonia, myoclonus, restless regs, dyskinesia. Um, some of those could look like ticks, and it's, it takes an experienced um, neurologist, psychiatrist, uh, professional uh, to know uh, what's ticks and what's something else. As neurologists, one of our um, uh, most important differential diagnosis um, uh, pieces are to make sure that uh, somebody's not having any seizures. Sometimes very subtle seizures could look like uh, ticks. And, um, you know, there certainly a EEG or video EEG would be um, the best test to, to rule that out. And obviously that has major implications because uh, ticks have a whole different uh, way of being treated than, than movement disorders, uh, medically specifically. So what, about, what happens in children with ticks? And, uh, or is this a, mostly a pediatric disorder? Is it an adult disorder? It really can be a lifelong disorder. Most patients with ticks occur early in life, in five and six. The, the worst years are those preteen years, and I tell my patients that uh, two-thirds of patients uh, burn out or improve to almost no ticks uh, after, after adolescence, but there certainly are some adults who have ticks as well. Uh, the problem with any of these uh, studies um, is that you really need a very large group of patients uh, to be followed for many years to learn the, the natural history of this disease. So, as you, as you saw I, uh, tonight, um, I, I did not mention um, uh, 
many of the uh, psych psychiatric comorbidities because I'm leaving that to uh, my colleague who will discuss um, particularly obsessive compulsive disorders and uh, attention deficit disorder. Um, and I'm concentrating uh, mostly on the tics. And when it comes to treatment as well, I'm going to leave the, um, uh, the treatment of those uh, comorbid psychiatric uh, issues to uh, the psychiatrist, to Dr. Braun, and uh, I'm going to talk about the treatment of, of, uh, of the Tourette syndrome, of, of tic disorder, of the tic disorder in Tourette syndrome. Um, so it's very interesting that there are only two drugs that are actually, um, uh, both of which uh, affect dopamine, both of which are very old, which are formally approved for pharmacotherapy treatments of Tourette syndrome, and that's haloperidol and pimazide. Haldol and, and ORAP are their uh, brand names. Um, they both um, have considerable side effects. Uh, they can be sedating. Uh, they can have movement disorders associated with them in and of themselves. Um, uh, but they are very effective. Um, the, um, but it, it, these drugs, because of their side effects, are not what, um, what, what we call first-line treatment. Um, the um, the first-line treatment of tics in Tourette syndrome um, is probably habit reversal therapy, if, if you can do it. Uh, the, the habit reversal therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy um, um, learning what the tick is, learning how to reverse that habit by doing something else. Um, it takes a lot of work. Dr. Braun will, uh, will discuss it since we divided up um, medical treatment of ticks versus um, uh, psychiatric or mental, mental health ways of treating the tick disorder between um, Dr. Braun and myself. Um, uh, you know, he, will, he will discuss um, th those interventions. There are lots of other medications which um, which uh, affect ticks and decrease ticks. Um, um, just ignore that phone. Sorry. Um, the um, um, the SSRIs, uh, the uh, atypical antipsychotics. Um, Will um, will also, are also beneficial for ticks, and the atypicals are better than haloperidol and, uh, and pimazide in terms of the uh, complications. One thing I want to discuss uh, for a few minutes tonight, uh, actually in wrap up, <coughs> is that there's been a literature for quite some time about using some of the anti seizure drugs uh, for uh, a treatment for ticks and. Um, uh, at Gordia Children's Hospital, myself and my colleagues for a number of years now have been using Toparamate, uh, which is Topamax, which is the brand name, uh, and as a uh, first-line drug. We feel um, um, that uh, it is superior to um, the other drugs listed. Uh, I didn't even mention the alpha agonists, the clonidine and, um, and guanfacine, um, because th those drugs are sedating. Um, and uh, we, we find that topiramate in, in lower dosages is not sedating at all. Um, this particular anti-seizure drug works um, by enhancing GABA, GABA amino, gamma aminobutyric acid, which is an um, inhibitor and therefore um, uh, decreases the innervation, and uh, that's how it prevents seizures. And in remarkably low doses, it's um, extremely effective um, for ticks. Um, this particular study uh, done by Dr. Jankovic uh, used only a small number of patients. I think there were 29 patients, but it was an excellent scientific study in the sense that it was a double-blinded study, both the, the patient and the um, physician who gave the medication did not know whether they got a placebo uh, or the real drug. Uh, the, um, um, the, um, the, they, um, and, but there was a very significant uh, improvement in the patients uh, um, when they went to, to that drug. 
um, to the to, uh, to the toparamate when the double blind uh, situation was uh, revealed after the, at the end of the study, uh, and it was statistically significant. Um, Um, so, in summary, um, this is Tourette's syndrome is um, a fascinating neurobiological disorder. Um, um, its major neurological uh, uh, manifestations are its tics. Um, its psychiatric manifestations are myriad, particularly uh, ADHD and obsessive compulsive disorder. But there are uh, other things: rage attacks and. Um, other psychiatric conditions that are comorbid with this, with Tourette syndrome, um, and uh, uh, I think Dr. Braun's uh, presentation will complement mine, since I spoke mostly about, almost exclusively about the uh, 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 Tourette syndrome and its uh, neurological manifestations and and what I consider the the best treatment for that. Um, Thank you for your attention tonight, and uh, I think I will have some time for questions now. Dr. Bennett, thank you. That's a lot of great information and a great explanation of a, a variety of things having to do with TS. We have a little bit of time and a number of questions, so I'm going to launch right into the Q&A. And uh, this question is from an adult with a diagnosis of Tourette at about age 10. And the question has to do with there being a connection between TS and sensitivity to extreme psychological reactions to certain noises. And the example that she gives is when we hear certain, she hears certain mouth noises, such as smacking or chomping or something like that, that she has a, an abnormal physical reaction. She said her body tenses and she urges with feelings of anger. Uh, it, it's trying to determine if that could be TS related. Could you talk about that a little bit? Um, absolutely. I, I think uh, we, we alluded to this when we talked about the um, the feedback loop, the frontal cortex to striatal uh, pathways, uh, you know, what we see and feel and hear um, has a significant uh, uh, impact upon tics about uh, how we react to things. Um, um, and um, th there is definitely a relationship. Um, I think many of you know, and I think there was a webinar earlier in the year, which I unfortunately did not listen to. Spectrum, especially early in life, have various sensitivities and and sensory issues, uh, and um, they're also it's a it's a hypersensitivity. Has, probably has to do with with dopamine uh, and uh, so the these cortical striatal dopaminergic pathways are, are all related I think it, it makes sense neurobiologically and the answer to the question is is it part of my TS the answer is yes okay thank you um, you talked about neurological testing uh, so is there and, and I understand that there is this feeling on parents that, you know, the kids get tested. So would you talk about standard neurological testing and, and whether or not it would be required to have a TS diagnosis, but the value of doing it? Okay, even, it's though it, it's, even though it's not, maybe not technically required, there's a certain value to providing that. Exactly. It, it's certainly not uh, not required. It, it's it, there, uh, the diagnosis of TS is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, you need to have motor tics and vocal tics present for greater than a year, starting in childhood. Um, but um, uh, you, you saw on one of my slides the long list of uh, differential diagnoses of other movement disorders, and I mentioned uh, seizures. Um, and uh, you know, every so often, it's not 100% clear, uh, and you know, we we do need to um, 
to do either an EEG or an MRI to, to look for, for something else, uh, and sometimes even um, a blood test or two. Um, you know, there are still people who get, um, you know, I did have one slide on pandas, and there are people who get routine um, uh, antibodies, uh, ASLOs, uh, um, uh, on, uh, on patients with Tourette syndrome to see if they're in the rare group of, uh, of patients whose tics are worse uh, after, uh, after strep infections. Um, it's not an unreasonable thing to do, um, um, but the, the, so the answer is it's a clinical diagnosis, um, but sometimes um, um, you want something a little more um, to rule out anything else. Okay, good. Um, so, what should a parent do if they suspect that uh, the child has TS, or they're looking for signs of it because it's, you know, in an, some part of the extended family? What what kind of advice would you give to parents when they're they're just kind of starting out on this? So uh, the because the disease is is by history, it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, I mean, time. I've been doing this, as you know, Kelly, for uh, many years, um, being a pediatric neurologist, and for um, uh, I don't know, between 25 and 30 years, uh, seeing patients with tic disorders, and uh, it, it, things have changed. Now, patients are coming into the office and telling me the diagnosis. Before, I used to make the diagnosis um, because there's so much more information available on the web, and because of organizations like. Um, the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome. So um, it, the parents can really look up the DSM-5 and make the diagnosis themselves. Um, but um, so history is important. You know, if there were transient tics, um, you, you know, for a few months and then nothing came back for a year or two and then uh, different tics came on, then that piece of history is important. So I think, you know, um, Jotting down that history, or um, um, you know, watching the child, you know, for comorbid um, OCDs and intrusive or obsessive thoughts, uh, um, the ADHD comorbidity. Uh, um, they, 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 it's all in the history and in the documentation. Um, and any uh, good neurologist, when he takes that history, uh, when he or she takes that history, uh, does does go over that. Okay, so if you had a, a family that came in and said, you know, we've been observing what appears to be ticks and this other behaviors over, for the past six months, would that six months of their observation be counted towards that sort of 12-month period that, you know, is the kind of the standard term that you'd want to follow ticks? Exactly. You, 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 can't, you can't make the... Um, uh, DSM-5 diagnosis of Tourette syndrome unless it's been present for greater than a year, but um, I tell parents that, you know, and it also depends on what happened to other family members. You know, if you have a mom and dad who have, uh, and I have many, many families like this, uh, you know, uh, with a parent who has Tourette syndrome and, um, you know, they know their child is a, a chip off the DNA block, so to speak, and, um, you know, we... Um, um, you know, they, they accept it, it's, um, it's part of them, and it's, uh, you know, we, we, we joke about it. Uh, you know, I, I love that movie that the um, TSA and HBO put out a number of years ago where um, they interviewed about five kids. And I met those kids at a child neurology society meeting. Where one, of, one of the kids says, um, uh, I'm, I'm normal, I'm a regular kid, I just have this, this TS. And it's true, they're all they're regular people. They have this neurological condition, this um, chemical imbalance, so to speak, which gives them, you know, the the OCDs or the tics, and it makes them a little different. But um, you know, some and sometimes they they buy the diagnosis. Sometimes they're a little bit shy, you know, a little bit shy. But maybe by the next time you see them, six months later, they make the diagnosis. That, that, uh, they're, all, they're all normal kids with a neurological disorder. 
that uh, that movie is um, I have Tourette, but Tourette doesn't have me, and it plays every once. It was on HBO, and every once in a while it'll show up again. But it's it's really a, a well done, it's well classic. done video. Yeah, really good. I've seen it, I've seen it about thirty times. <laughs> and I also know parents, a family who have uh, three kids with Tourette, and by the time they got to the third kid, they were diagnosing that kid at about six months because they had just seen the patterns, and and now they're um, you know they're all adults and they've moved on, and and life seems to be way normal for them now, which is great. Uh, so, in terms of a neurologist or a psychiatrist for diagnosis. Is there an age or a particular time frame a parent might want to look at to determine one, one clinician over the other in, in terms of making that kind of choice? Um, it's a good question for Dr. Braun and myself. I did have discussed this with Dr. Braun and um, I think he, he and I both feel that this is a uh, a neurobiologic disorder, and the tics are what um, what usually brings them to medical attention. But when the other, uh, when the comorbid um, issues bring you to medical attention, when you have OCD that you can't leave your house, or you have ADHD that is um, off the wall, and you're worried about um, um, medication will make my tics worse, etc., um, uh, then sometimes um, you know, the uh, the primary care provider there is a psychiatrist. I think most of the time for diagnosis and for uh, uh, for initial diagnosis, um, you're usually seen by a neurologist. Whoops, I'm sorry, I had muted myself there for just a second. Okay, all right, we have time for one last question, and I'm going to wrap it up with this. Um, if someone has the gene for Tourette, or any of the other comorbid disorders, could those genes be, and this is in quotes, encouraged by inappropriate handling and become more intensified? Or can they be, and again this question is in, this word is in quotes, starved by proper handling and be less of a problem? Um, difficult question, but I, and a good question, and I think you know, you know, part of uh, Tourette syndrome is m many people with Tourette syndrome have uh, colalia or palalalia. That would be, you know, repeating somebody's words or repeating your own words uh, twice. Um, and there's an echopraxia where if you see somebody with a certain tick, if somebody touches their nose, you touch your nose. But, you know, that's true in a lot of people, you know, um, you know, talk about uh, uh, one person takes a cell phone out, and another person, the next person takes their cell phone out. Right? Happens all the time. Um, so echopraxia. Um, you know, a lot of parents are worried if they see. I have parents who won't show that movie we spoke about because they don't want their children to see other kids with ticks um, because they're afraid they're gonna it's gonna make their ticks worse. Um, mm -hmm. In a sense, that's silly. Um, in a sense, it's uh, it 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 is. Uh, they're not they're not incorrect. Um, but, you know, it is life, and um, and as you said earlier, people have to go on um, living their lives. I, I think I think knowledge and education is uh, perhaps the most important thing in terms of treatment. I spend a lot of time um, in, in my office visits uh, um, talking about your organization and, and the national TSA and talking about different websites that uh, people can go to and, and different programs that there are for, for children and for adults. And um, um, it's very hard to, uh, um, you know, to avoid other patients with tics when it, it's so common and, um, and, um, um, and ubiquitous. Uh, if you you know, it, it is somewhat of a cultural disease. If you didn't see anybody with ticks, would you not have ticks? You you'll still would have ticks, but maybe not to the same extent. Um, it's, um, as I said, a difficult question, but, you know, it's one, you know I think the important thing is to make your child, um, your patient, uh, as normal as possible out in the world there. And, um, you know, if they... Um, you know, are going to have ticks because they see somebody else have ticks, then 
it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we're going to end it there. Dr. Bennett, thank you so much for your time tonight and your presentation. Now, I'm pleased to introduce psychiatrist Dr. Joshua Braun.